What is up my friends? Today I'm gonna to walk you through the step-by-step -step process that I use to turn this 18 inch Cobalt Kinetics rifle into this. This is my ideal setup for IPSC competition shooting. It's a very specific sport. We have an overall very soft shooting rifle with a flat trajectory and I wanna show you the process. Now why would you wanna have two identical 18 inch rifles? Well, I'm flying to Finland here soon for the IPSC rifle world shoot and I wanna make sure that I have not only my primary rifle, but a backup rifle just in case anything happens. If you're gonna go overseas and shoot in the big, the big matches, having a backup is important. So let's go ahead and go through every step of this process, all of the different parts that I'm using to get this thing set up perfectly and tuned for precision. Now, before I dive fully into what we're doing with this rifle, just a quick disclaimer. I do have relationships with most of these companies Ergo Grips, Cobalt Kinetics, Vortex Optics, those are sponsors of mine, partnerships that I've had with these companies for years. Uh, Hyperfire Triggers, Superlative Arms, Unrivaled, these are companies that I'm friends with, the owners or parts of the company, and I just appreciate what they have. It's products that I believe in, and they've either supplied the products or I've paid a discounted rate. Badger Ordnance, I just like their products. I have no relationship with the company. Um, I like their mounts. With all that being out of the way, it's irrelevant to how I build this rifle. I wanna build this rifle the best I possibly can. I have the option to pick any parts out there in the industry, and these are the ones that I've chosen. So let's go ahead and dive into step one of what I wanna do with this rifle. Now the first part we're gonna do is the lower. So let's get rid of this upper for a second. We'll set this aside and get back to that. Now the first thing is I'm gonna swap this grip out. The cobalt grip I like, it's not bad, uh, but it's just not my favorite angle. And these have been my go-to grip for a very, very long time. The ergo grips, aggressive texture. It's very comfortable. This rubberized texture is just how I like it. So we're gonna swap that out. And also we need to take the buffer out of this. Now, I asked not to have a trigger in here. I didn't need a trigger because Hyperfire was sending me their uh, two stage. But let's go ahead and swap this grip out real quick. We need a 3 16 inch Allen to pop this old one off. So we are going to need that spring. Uh, we can either keep the same screw or use the one that's provided by Ergo. I just always swap out for a new screw. Now these grips come with this little grip plug. I've never used these. They always seem to fall out, so I don't even deal with it. This is a little spacer. If you have a mil spec lower, this will fit into the trigger guard area and it just makes it a little bit easier on your finger. Now, let's go ahead and drop this in. We still have our safety detent in there, so I'm gonna put the spring back into the grip. I like to start the screw here. Just like so. All right, grip is installed, safety is working. We're gonna go ahead and swap out the buffer and uh, take out the buffer retaining pin here. First thing we're gonna do is pop this old buffer out. Well, not old buffer, it's a brand new buffer. But this is the Cobalt uh, Viltor Rifle Length Buffer System. Um, they have different weights on this. This is a number two weight. It works really well. But now we gotta remove the buffer retaining pin. All right, now we've got this thing in the vise. It's not clamped in there super hard, just hard enough for me to make sure it's not gonna go anywhere. I'm gonna go take this castle nut off. And we take this castle nut off Obviously you gotta break the, the um, stakes on it. But keep in mind, as soon as we back this thing out, this little uh, buffer retaining pin is going to want to wanna spring out of there. So I like to cover that up. As I unscrew that, we can go ahead and break this thing loose. So we can take that pin and spring out of there. Oh, slipped in there. So that's what we gotta get out. Now we're just gonna go ahead and close this thing back up. right to here and screw this back on. We will re-tighten it and stake it down. Now, I'm not sure where my stakes are or my punches are, so I can't stake that down right now. We'll do that later on, but I will put an index mark on here with a paint pen. It's a good thing to have. Now that we got the buffer out of there, we're gonna go ahead and throw in the unrivaled two-stage buffer system. They call it the uh, UDB M4 Dead Blow. The cool thing about this buffer system is it's got a captured spring. I, I've run the JP captured systems before. Uh, obviously I've run the cobalt system before. Um, and the one thing I will tell you with these buffer systems is they are designed for the lightweight bolt carrier. You can run it with a full mass um, and get some of the benefit out of it, but these are designed more towards the competition side. So 
for reliability wise, for extreme durability and just rugged use, I will still go with this in like my work rifle for the competition and fine tuning things, trying to get the least recoil possible. This is gonna help you a little bit. So we have a captured spring here and this is your second stage with the thicker spring. So as this comes down, once it hits, that's gonna start pushing that back a little bit harder, helps stripping that top round off the mag and gets you a little bit faster return while softening that impact in the back. So it's a pretty good little system. Now, because Cobalt uses an A5 buffer system, this fits a little bit too deep. So it's actually gonna sit down to about here, which is a problem. So we have exactly $2.75 worth of quarters that we're gonna drop in here. Um, I will tell you that uh, they're making me Actually, look, they have a couple of these in here. I wonder if those will fit. Uh, not quite. Um, they're making me a Delrin insert that'll take up that space instead of using the quarters, and that should be good. Uh, but for right now, the quarters work just fine. It's no issue, it runs just, just as well. So this fits in pretty tight. Um, once we get that in there, you can see where I want that is to be flush with the buffer tube, just like a normal buffer, and have free movement there. So now that we've got the buffer installed, let's go ahead and throw in this trigger. Now I've always run single stage triggers in my competition rifles. This time I've decided to go with a two stage trigger after doing a lot of testing with uh, my competition rifle versus my work rifle, which is running a two stage. And I just think that this is gonna give me a little bit of an edge on the long range, taking up a little bit of slack, having a, a really crisp wall for that second shot versus having just a, a static wall. Uh, so that's why I decided to run a two-stage trigger this time. Um, I, I, I like it so far, and I haven't seen any detriment in my splits. The only thing that I have noticed is that it takes a little bit of getting used to to make sure that I get my, um, my trigger reset fully. Sometimes I get a little trigger freeze in there because I short stroke it. Now, this trigger is pretty easy. You don't have to take out the safety to put it in. We're just going to drop this in uh, here, line up the hole, put your little pin in. This one's gonna drop in up top, as long as I put the hammer the face in the right direction. This one's a little bit trickier because we gotta get this in the right angle, make sure the hammer spring's where it needs to go. We don't wanna bend up that hammer spring at all. And then we get this set here. Now, once I get it started in there, you can take a little hammer, or in my case, the little uh, Allen wrench here. Pop that in, I need to put the safety down, and then we're gonna line up the hole here and finish pushing the rest of the way in. There we go. We can test that without the extra springs in there, but what really makes these um, hyperfire shine is you get this extra sp spring tension that does a really good job of making sure that you, we don't have any light primer strikes. So we're gonna put the green springs on here. This is the lower weight for the lighter trigger. We put this shoe on. Make sure you use eye protection when you do this so it doesn't launch back at you. It's always a good idea. Push this in here. Now they do provide a little, a little thing here. They provide one of these little spikes. Personally, I like using the Allen wrench because I have a little bit more uh, grip on this thing. And we can push that right into here. Now you can see where the spring lined up in here. Everything locks together. Cock it back. Get the second stage here, like so. So you can see here, first stage of the trigger, second stage of the trigger breaks free, and that hammer goes forward. So everything's working here, safety's working, that's all good. Now the lower is all set. Let's go ahead and do the upper. Now as I mentioned earlier, we are going to be running a lightweight bolt carrier. So instead of this full mass bolt carrier from Cobalt, which is what I usually run in my three gun rifles, and even my duty rifle and everything, we're gonna run this super lightweight titanium bolt carrier group from uh, Unrivaled. Again, these guys are friends of mine. They do a really good job with these competition parts because they are competitors at the highest level. Um, Kyle's won you know, big national level matches. Zach's won national level matches. So when you got good shooters building good parts for themselves and then they bring it to the public, that's always a good thing. And I like to support those guys uh, and what they're doing. So. When we're doing this, we want to make sure that we're using their provided titanium firing pin, and we're going to take the bolt out of this carrier and swap it over. So pull the little pin out here, take that firing pin out. That gets set aside. This is what we're using. I'm going to wipe this thing down and put some fresh lube on it. It's always fun. I've got 
old event shirts from this is the 2023 Independence Range Day. <laughs> These become my cleaning rags when uh, I don't sell out of them. So, so we're gonna put a little CLP on here. This Radco CLP does a great job. Um, again, friends with that company. I was sponsored by them for several years. Great company, great freaking products. Even though they're not no longer sponsoring matches or shooters because of their own budget restrictions, I still use the product because it's fantastic. So we're gonna go ahead and set this carrier up. Pull that forward. I like to throw just a thin layer of lube on that um, on that firing pin. Not a lot. Oh, this uh, carrier does come with a key here. I shouldn't use a bolt or a firing pin because we don't want to lose, ding the tip of that or anything. So we can use this one here. Push that all the way in. Put your cotter pin back in. Now this is all set up. Okay. Bolt carrier, this thing is super light. I don't know the exact weight on this. I'm sure you can look it up, but uh, it's a super lightweight carrier and it does require some tuning. You don't want to run this with a regular buffer system and gas system. It'll beat the crap out of it. You might be able to. Uh, obviously, I would check in with the guys over there at uh, Unrivaled, but I probably wouldn't recommend it. Throw a little bit of lube on this. Wipe it down and reassemble. Now, especially when I'm doing a new, brand new setup like this, we want to get things really well lubricated. I want to run this thing as wet as possible, especially with the CLP, because it's going to soak in and get this thing set up to be, you know, long lasting, well lubricated. Once we have this first, you know, 2000 rounds through it, I mean, really the first few hundred rounds, you're going to get it broken in. But the first, you know, a couple thousand is where you start to build some wear, wear in it. It starts to build up that uh, carbon layer, and that's not a bad thing. I don't, I don't like to have a perfectly pristinely clean gun. Now, with these lightweight parts, we do want to keep it pretty clean, but um, we definitely have to keep it lubricated. And I like to lube it heavily to start off with. So this is all set, ready to go. Let's go ahead and take off the muzzle device, swap that out, and then we're also going to do the uh, gas block. Now the first thing we need to do to swap out the gas block is take off this handguard. And this is actually one of the coolest parts of the Cobalt Kinetics rifles because this handguard has four sets of screws, eight screws in total, locking it to the receiver. And I'll so show you what I mean here in just a second. So now that we have these four sets of screws out, we can slide this whole handguard off and you can see actually how this receiver is set up. So this whole chunk here is actually one piece of aluminum that's milled out. This is the receiver. This is the barrel nut that threads into the receiver. So it's a little bit different than a traditional barrel, barrel nut. And you can see they obviously have it lined up to where it's torque to spec. I believe it's 80 foot pounds or 70 foot pounds. I think it's 80 foot pounds to torque that. Um, but you do need a specific thing that slides over top that you throw on a torque wrench. Now let's go ahead and pop off this um, gas block. Now these are dimpled in. The, the barrel's dimpled so that we can get these gas, uh, gas block screws locked into place. They don't slide around at all. This takes a 332nd Allen key and this comes off. Oh, we forgot to take this off. We've got to take off the muzzle device first. Now we went ahead and locked this thing in. I did heat this up with a heat gun to break it free. It had some rock set on here so it was really tough earlier but we use that heat gun to break it loose so that I didn't have to do that 20 minutes of heating up on here. Now, this is off. We can go ahead and take the gas port off or the gas tube off. The Superlative Arms gas block uh, is one of my favorites. Now, there's some other ones out there that I, I'm interested in trying, but I've run Superlative for many years. Uh, they sell these in a kit if you want to buy it all assembled already with the gas tube installed. Uh, this is a titanium gas block, so it takes off a little bit of weight. And one thing that you do have to be mindful of with this are the screws here that are retaining the gas block are not in the exact same spot as these screws. And I learned this on the last rifle I set up. As you can see, these are a little bit wider. These are a little bit narrower. So when I first put it on here, I slid this all the way to the end and locked it in using this top one as the index point. And this one was kind of, you know, just against the barrel. I could re-dimple this barrel on the bottom if I wanted to. 
I don't think it's worth doing all that. So when I put this in, we want to make sure that it's in the right spot. If not, you could, it'll still run like I did get the gun to run, but it wasn't running consistently and I wasn't getting full gas. So what I noticed is that if I shift this thing a little bit forward, we have a little bit of gap here, you know, a couple thousandths of an inch to move that forward. Now what I want you to see here is this little gap that I'm talking about. I want to use this bottom set screw as the one that sets exactly where this needs to be. So I'm going to start bringing this slowly in, not to the point right here where it's tight, but to where I can still move it and slowly, slowly add screw tension until we are fully into the dimple on that, on that barrel. Um, we want to check it forward and backwards and left and right. So as we get everything set in here, it's centered up. That is going to put that gas port directly over the gas hole on the barrel. This one, I'm going to tighten down. Now that we have this tightened down, the second one is tightened against the barrel. I'm going to pop this one out and we're going to throw a little red Loctite on there just to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. All right, now we're going to do the same thing with this one. Now, one thing that you're going to notice is this is sitting all the way down flush with it. This one's obviously popped up because it's not sitting into the uh, dimple. That's not a big deal. We have one in the dimple. This one's against the barrel. We've got it locked tight in. We shouldn't have any issues. So let's go ahead and throw the rail back on here. As you can see, this rail slides right over top and locks into place. Look at that. Just a beautiful lockup right back here. Now, I also want to do a little dab of blue. Loctite on each one of these before I put them in Just to ensure they're not going anywhere. We don't need to put a ton on here just in case you ever need to take this thing off But again a little bit doesn't hurt All right now that we have the rail back installed We're gonna go ahead and take care of the muzzle device, but I wanted to show you this This is the allen key that comes with the superlative armors gas blocks This is important. You want to make sure we have a hold of this because it has the hex or the uh, T wrench that goes on to the bottom of it. And then this right here is the key, especially if you have a longer rail because you can get really deep in there. Uh, this starts out fully closed, okay? Their gas block is now closed off. When you go back to 18 clicks, two, three, four, five, six, 18 clicks, that's four and a half full rotations. That is now fully open gas. If you go close, from, if you close down from that, screw it back in, that's going to restrict the gas. If you open up, it starts to bleed off the gas. So there's two different settings on this. We can restrict the gas flow that's going in, or we can open it up more and it's going to bleed off the gas, which also effectively reduces the amount of gas pressure that's going in the gun, which is what I like to do. I like to use the bleed off method. So we're gonna preset this out to 24 clicks. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. See where that sets us once we start shooting, but that should be pretty close to good. Then we can adjust as necessary. Obviously we wanna to test to make sure it's locking back and cycling properly, but that's all we need to do with the gas block while we're indoors. So let's go ahead and figure out what we're doing with this muzzle device. Now, last rifle world shoot, I ran the UM Tactical Rage, and I really like this muzzle device because it allows you to tune the recoil pattern with these three port washers. You unscrew this, you adjust these as necessary. I've put videos up about this before, and it's a really great product, really great company. Uh, what I found is this Unrivaled is also tunable, a little bit more tunable than the U Tactical. It's a little bit more difficult to tune as well, but it also reduces the rearward recoil that's felt. So not a huge deal, but it does make a little bit of a difference. And obviously I wanna take every advantage I can. So this is the Unrivaled. We have one, two, three, four, five different ports up here and then three ports here that we can tune. So all eight of these positions can be tuned for you. So what we wanna do is we wanna get this thing timed onto this barrel to make sure it's squared up with the receiver because we don't want anything offset. Let's see where this ends up. Okay, we need to take out some of these washers. Now you can either use a crush washer or these little spacers. Either one's fine. Um, I've got the spacers on here already. I have a crush washer if I want to. Spacers I have no problem with. I actually like how we can tune, fine tune this thing with the spacer. So here you can see it is slightly off, which is good because now I can tighten it down a little bit and get it timed properly. For this, I've just got a simple crescent wrench. I'm not worried about the finish of this too much because we're gonna be shooting it a lot and it's gonna get dinged up. 
All right, so got a little bit to go here. And that looks just about right. Now, because I've already tuned this one for this rifle, for my other rifle, I'm gonna go ahead and run the same setup that I have in this one. These screws that come with the, the unrival brake are either blocks or they're half blocks. So you can either completely block it, you can half block it, or you can leave the hole open. So with this one, I have it blocked, blocked, blocked. The left side I have blocked, blocked, and the top is blocked. The top right side is open and the right side is a half block. So this one and this one are letting a little bit of gas out. That's keeping that thing directly on target. So we're gonna set this thing up to start out with this same exact setup and see how that runs. I'm gonna bring this in a little bit closer for you. This is a fully blocked screw. You can see it stops right there at the bottom of its hole. And let me see here. I think here's a partial. So you can see this one will literally slide right on the Allen wrench um, and it half blocks the hole. So we're gonna go ahead and put this half block on the far right side here. This is a little tricky because you gotta keep this on the end just to get it started. Once you get it started, it's not a problem. I'm gonna start with these without doing any Loctite. What I will tell you is you want to go ahead and Loctite these once you have it tuned how you want it uh, because otherwise they can start to back out. Now, pretty soon they'll get um, carbon locked and that's okay because once it's tuned, it is tuned. Now I do have one of these that I shot so much, it was actually literally blocked up. The ports are blocked up. They want me to send that in so they can cut it in half and see how much abuse I put through it. But I probably had uh, 40,000 rounds on that. So it was time for a new one anyway. So let's go ahead and block all of these off. And then I think we're gonna be just about ready. So this comes with enough of these full screws to block off uh, the entire thing, plus have an extra one or two, and then it comes with two of the half blocks. So if you need more of those little half screws, which, I mean, you shouldn't, but if you do, you can always call Unrivaled, and I'm sure they'll be happy to ship you one. But this is all set up now. Let's go ahead and put this thing together. Now here I was thinking that we were all ready to take this thing out on the range, and I realized we have an optic to put on. So I've got the Badger, Badger Ordnance mount. Now, I like these mounts. These are This is a 1.7 inch height on this. These are pretty hard to find in stock. You can sometimes get the tan one in stock, but I reached out on Instagram, put it out on my Instagram story, seeing if anybody had to spare one of these. Uh, my guy, Bo, hit me up. It's like, hey, I've got one in the box that I've never used before. So thank you, Bo, for hooking me up with that. Um, paid for it, obviously, but it was really cool to get that uh, as quickly as I did. And one thing I will say, the Badger Ordnance Condition 1 mounts are pretty slick because I do like that 1.7 inch height. The 193 is just a little bit too high. The 154 uh, can be a little bit low, especially if we're going into a prone position. The 170 just seems to be like that perfect medium. That being said, they also have a offset mount that goes directly into the scope mount, which I like. I've got two of those on order. They should be here this week. That will be a little bit different than this setup, which is running a Strike Industries mount on the side here. This is gonna move the optic up to here. That'll be right in line with the scope and it's designed to mount all together. So I'm pretty stoked about that. It's something I'm gonna be trying out. I've always run just an offset like this, either here or even up in front of it. But with this setup, we can move the scope mount a little bit farther back and get a little bit more range of motion out of that optic. One thing that you wanna do, or well, a couple things that you wanna do for your scope mounts is we wanna make sure that when we lock this in, we push this forward. Now this one locks in pretty well. There's not a whole lot of forward or back movement. We wanna push this forward because when the rifle is moving backwards into recoil, that's what can cause that to come loose. It can cause it to have any issues. So always push that scope mount all the way forward or if you have red dot, obviously we wanna do the same thing. We'll get these finger tight here and then I will tell you you should always torque this to spec, which this one is half inch nut to 65 inch pounds. However, I do not have a torque wrench that goes to 65 inch pounds, something that will be remedying very soon. Uh, so <laughs> for now, I'm using a good old crescent wrench to approximately their inch pounds. Um, is that perfect? No. Get, a, get yourself a torque wrench. I will get myself, I have a torque wrench, but this one only uses the 50 inch pounds. Um, which is great for the top, but not so good for the side. So we're gonna pop these off. 
The other thing is when you're mounting an optic, we want to make sure that you're set up for your natural point of aim. If you don't know where you need this optic mount, make sure that you put the optic in it before you lock this thing down. I know where it needs to be set up because I've set up many, many rifles this way. But if you're setting yours up for the first time, make sure you put the optic in the mount, find your natural point of aim and your good shooting position. Check that in prone and kneeling and off of barricades, and then you can lock it into place. So we're gonna put these in where they need to be. We've got a brand new Vortex Razor 1 to 6. It's a Gen 2 or HD Gen 2 E. Something about brand new optics just makes me happy. So we're gonna pull all this stuff out. Yes. Now I have the 1 to 10, and a lot of people have asked me why don't you, why aren't you running the 1 to 10 for the match? It's a the newer optic and etc. Right. Personally, I love the 1 to 6. The 1 to 10 is a phenomenal optic and is my go-to when I have matches with longer distances. This match, everything is within 300 to 350 yards at the most. So the 1 to 6 is my preferred optic for that. Uh, one thing that you want to make sure that we do is obviously adjust the diopter for your eyeball. They come standard, all the way screwed in. I'm going to back that out to where it should be somewhere in there, and then I'll confirm that once I mount the scope and, and actually get it up to my eyeball. The other thing that you really want to be aware of is that the optic is not pressed against either side of the mount. So we don't want this all the way up to here and we don't want this all the way back here. This needs to have some range of motion, even if it's a little bit, you know, a quarter inch here is fine, preferably somewhere in the middle, but we don't want it all the way up against one side or the other. That can cause issues with you maintaining zero, with you getting a good zero in the first place, because if you're all the way up against here, now when we clamp this thing down, it may be putting unequal pressure on part of this optic versus the middle of it. So we wanna make sure that that is somewhere in the middle. For me, with my natural point of aim, I want this optic to be somewhere in the vicinity of the back of my charging handle. Now, I'm gonna get this thing finger tight, and then I'm gonna put it onto the lower, confirm where it needs to be, and then I'm gonna level this to the upper to make sure everything is squared up and plumb, so we're able to make sure that our, project or our, our trajectory is correct through the reticle. Now, how do we figure out your natural point of aim? And this is a really good question that you need to be checking for yourself. First of all, we need to set the stock the correct length. For me, I wanna have my chest squared up to the target. I'm gonna bring this up into the, as close to the center line of my chest as I can. Uh, find a natural wrist angle. I don't wanna bring this too far up where I'm really bending my wrist hard. I also wanna have it too far out where I'm like up against the receiver. So right here, my elbow is gonna be bent here and I'm bringing this up. Now, to find my natural point of aim with rifle, I wanna have this, so we'll start off on one power. I'll close my eyes, I'll bring it up, make sure my shooting structure is where it needs to be, open my eyes. Right now I've got a very clear view through the optic. It's a little bit crooked right now, but we're gonna get that squared away shortly. And then what we're gonna do is zoom all the way in on this. And I'm gonna go all the way up to six power and do the same thing. So from right here, I'll close my eyes, bring it up, make sure everything's where it needs to be, and then open my eyes. And again, I have perfect field of view at this distance. If I bring it in, I get a little bit of tunneling. If I back it out, I get some shadowing on the sides. So right here is where I want it. And like I said, it's right here at the back of the charging handle. That's right where it should be. I know that's where it's supposed to be set up. That's why I preset it there. And when I test it, closing my eyes, bringing it up on six power, opening my eyes, it is a perfectly clear field of view. One thing that you should also test is when you go down prone or into awkward barricade positions that you still can maintain that natural point of aim, get comfortable with it. The more comfortable you get in uncomfortable positions, the better shooter you're gonna be across the board. So now we need to make sure this is level and then we get to tighten this down to spec, which this is 20 inch pounds on each one. All right, now how do we wanna go ahead and do this? Now, first of all, I'm gonna go ahead and level the rifle forward and back. Then I'm gonna level the rifle on the horizontal. This is the really important one because if it's not level side to side, then we're not gonna get anywhere with the scope. Normally I have a small little level that I put on the back here. I can't find that anywhere, so I'm using this one. The benefit of having this directly attached to the receiver as part of the receiver is that this rail I can trust is also level with this. If this was a free float rail that had just attached to a barrel nut, not to the receiver itself, I wouldn't trust that. I would definitely wanna make sure that we were leveling based off of the receiver. But because this is all one piece basically, we can go ahead and do this. So this is level. Now we're gonna go ahead and level the optic. 
the optic is slightly off. Oh, too much, too much. There we go. Now we're level on the optic. I'll show you what we're looking at there. You can see we are nice and level on the optic. And now we're going to go ahead and make sure that this stays level while we tighten this down. Now another aspect of making sure the optic mount is correct is making sure that there is equal space between this gap and the gap on the right hand side. So I don't want to have one clamped all the way down and the other one have a big gap. I want to make sure that it's equal. So we're going to make sure that we do this in a crosshatch pattern and I'm maintaining the equality on each side. I'm going to keep these kind of tight to where I know that these are even and then we will go ahead and actually tighten them down to spec which is that 20 inch pounds. So this side on the right is a little bit more open than this one. So I'm gonna back off that screw a little bit to give me a little bit more on the right side. There we go. And I will take the time. I wanna take the time to really make sure that the optic is leveled and tightened down correctly. It's mounted correctly because otherwise you won't be hitting things and you won't know why. So it's always worth it to really take the time on the optic to make sure everything is exactly how it's supposed to be. Don't skimp there. Buy good optics, buy good mounts, take the time to make sure they're properly mounted. And now, looks like the weather is holding up at least for the next little bit. We are ready to go test this thing out. One of my favorite things about living where I live and having what I have is being able to work on this rifle in the shop, film, this little video in the studio and then run right out here to the range and test it out. This is uh, truly a privilege of living in this amazing country. I don't know what other country you can have your own private range like this and be able to do what I get to do. So I'm grateful, especially since tomorrow is the 4th of July. All right, time to do the first rounds of this rifle. Let's see how she does. That's pretty good. Now I'm looking at the brass ejection pattern is coming up here at about not quite a 45 degree angle, but it's definitely a little hot. So we're going to tune this gas down a little bit because I want that brass to be coming out here at about 90 degrees, maybe a little bit more, but she is super flat. Let's go ahead and change some things and come back. Now, if you recall, we set this at 24 clicks out. I'm going to bring this out to 25, 26, 27, 28. We just took it a whole nother turn. Let's just see if that thing runs at all. All right, now that brass is coming exactly where I want it to. Coming out here right at a 90 degree angle. And it's still locking back. So we've got the lock back. That's what we're looking for. Single shot lock back. We want to make sure it's locking back. We want to make sure the brass is coming where we want it to. Still locking back. Perfect ejection pattern. I love it. I haven't adjusted the scope at all, but obviously we're good enough to be hitting a, a 40 yard C zone. So that's not bad. And honestly, I'm pretty happy with this. It didn't take any extra tuning um, or not much extra tuning. The scope, obviously I gotta dial that in. I'm gonna dial it in for my long range ammo, get all that zeroed. Once we get the mount, I'll go ahead and do an update on that. But uh, hey, that's a good project, guys. That is a success, successful project is what I should say. A 100% successful project. Now, that was a little issue because I slammed the mag in there and the lips gave way. It popped some rounds up into it, but I don't know if you guys can see this. Let's get back to here. That is shooting super soft, super flat. We're doubling up on that steel. It's good. So now what I got to do is we're going to go back. I'm just going to add some Loctite to these, make sure everything is good to go. And I'm going to put a lot more rounds on this rifle. In the next couple of days, I'm going to go out. I'm going to test the long range abilities of this, this rifle versus the other one. My my primary, decide which one's going to be my primary, figure out exactly what long range load I'm going to use. I have a 67 grain Supermatch from G9. That's a solid copper bullet. 
I have a 75 grain Hornady load from G9. I have a 77 grain TMK from G9. So a couple different loads I wanna test out. See what this rifle likes the most for the long range performance. Gather all that data, put it in the app. So there's a lot of homework left to do, but that is how we set this rifle up to be ready for rifle world shoot. Hope you guys liked that video. If you did, let me know down in the comments. Let me know what you liked, what you didn't like. If there's any questions you have, always hit me up. If you don't know about Dry Fire Mastery, go check out dryfiremastery.com. That is my company that I teach you guys how to be amazing competitive shooters. Uh, not only competitive shooters, but also shooting in general. If you wanna get good at shooting, you gotta dry fire. So hope you guys like that. Thank you guys for being part of it. I'm excited for this rifle. Thank you to all the companies that support me, support this build, support this video. Pretty stoked to be part of this community. Stoked to be out here on the range in a little weather coming in, but I got a few more rounds. I'm gonna throw in a last little clip of some slow-mo before we wrap this thing up.